the DuPont Cavalcade of America, starring Paul Lucas. Good evening. This is Paul Lucas. Tonight, our cavalcade plays about the distinguished American scientist, the wizard of X-ray, Michael Pupin. His rise to fame from the time he landed in these shores as a boy with only a nickel to his name is the American dream in action. And now, This Way to Tomorrow, starring Paul Lucas as Michael Pupin on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. I got a caught in the machine. Gosh, oh. Oh. Hey, Jim, come here. We got to get Tom to the hospital. Oh, oh it is you, Professor Pupin. I, I heard about the accident at the factory. Was, was the experiment successful? Yes, it was, Louis. Oh, wonderful. By Professor, I suppose there was never an experiment conducted under such conditions. I know. There was the man with hundreds of little pieces of metal embedded in his hand and forearm. And the doctor couldn't operate because he didn't know where exactly those pieces were. And he couldn't find out because the man could not keep his hand still for the full hour or more that's required to make an X-ray picture. But, uh, but you got the picture anyway? Your method worked? Oh, yes, Louis. Well, uh, uh, how much time did it take? Twenty seconds. (laughs) A good X-ray picture in twenty seconds. The surgeon was able to operate right away, and the man is going to be well. Well, congratulations, Professor. You must be very happy. You must be extremely happy that years of experimentation with X-ray just resulted in probably saving a man's life. If my work can be so regarded, for the moment, yes. I am happy, son. Uh, Professor. Yes? I'm glad you dropped into the lab here. I, I wanted to have you see what I've been doing. You haven't reached the end of your experiment. Oh, oh, no, far from it. Oh, I wondered. This thing you are doing is the sort of thing that will take months and months. <laughs> Don't I know it, though? Oh, uh, I haven't told you before, but there is a U.S. public health official who is interested in this experiment of yours. Really? Oh, of course. When I told him it was not my experiment, but that of a pupil of mine, he started to lose interest. But then I told him what an exceptional student you were. And when I told him that this experiment might result in a cure for tropical fevers, <laughs> well, he's interested now, and that's all you have to know. But the, the results may be negative. That's what I like about you. You are a scientist. You do not jump to conclusions. You are cautious. You are going to go far. Well, uh, uh, what is that you wanted to show me? Uh, my notebook. See? Uh-huh, yes, yes. Very clear, very neat. You'll be able to read it? Yes. But what do you mean? I'm quitting. You're... What did you say? I'm quitting. This is my last day in the laboratory. Well, a, a, a girl you are going to marry? No. And what is the matter? Why should you leave Columbia University? I can't stay here. It's impossible. Now, you can't leave here. Now, let us establish that fact right away. You cannot and you must not, not leave here. I don't know what is in your mind, what's troubling you, but you cannot leave this university or this laboratory. I don't want to use big-sounding phrases, but science needs you. I am leaving here, Professor. I would suggest Jimmy Holmes to take my place in this lab. You would, huh? (laughs) Here you have a talent and a spark that may possibly amount to genius, and you calmly suggest to me that I should take on a boy who is amiable and bright and who doesn't care. Well, at least he will be able to stay here. He's got a family that takes care of him. He has got... Everything. So that's it. It's because you are alone in the world. Well, where is your courage? No, no, it isn't because I am alone in the world. And I have courage. But I have sense, too. Yes, the sense to turn your back on a great career. All right, look, I have another notebook here. Look at it, you see? You see that column? Weekly income. And there, weekly outgo. And look at this, weekly deficit, $8.32. That is the average... 
Hmm. Well, that's serious. I don't understand. You get a good scholarship here, don't you? I get the best scholarship they offer. Well? Well, the scholarship is fine, but, but I need more money than it offers. I have problems that you never had, Professor. Is that so? Yes. I have to send money to the old country. So? I have a grandmother there, and, and my parents, and, and my sister. She's ill. She'll never be well. They depend on what I can send them. Huh. I see. Well, you do have a problem. Now, uh, look here, Louis. Uh, you live way downtown, don't you? Yes, Professor. Well, it happens that I have to go downtown myself now. Let's have dinner together and... Uh, I don't want charity. Oh, my goodness. All right. If you regard it as charity, I will let you pay for your own dinner. <laughs> well, if you can stand the kind of place I have to eat in. I imagine I've eaten in such a place many times. Come on, let's go. Did you mind eating in that place, Professor? My boy, I like a good beef stew. Don't be so sensitive. But why did you want me to come with you? Where are we going? To call on a friend of mine. I can't imagine you with a, with a friend in this section. Oh, I lived in this section for two years when I was quite young. Because you couldn't afford to live in a better section? Exactly. And because my rooming house was within walking distance of Cooper Union. Cooper Union? Yes, Cooper Union had a library with a fine reading room. Oh. Here. Now we are coming to my old boarding house. <laughs> Let's go in, shall we? All right. Mrs. Garrity still lives here. Mrs. Garrity? Well, Professor, have you been? Mrs. Garrity, how are you? I'm fine. Come in, will you? Thank you. This is a young friend of mine, Mrs. Garrity. Then he's welcome. Now, sit right down. I'll make you a cup of tea. No, thank you, Mrs. Garrity. We have to be on our way. Oh, Professor, that's just like you. I haven't seen you for months, and now you're going to run out on me. Oh, I'll be back. I was just wondering whether my young friend here reminds you of anything. Hmm. He reminds me of you at his age when you lived here. Are you uh, related to the Professor boy? No, I wish I were. Well, he'd be a good man to be related to now. But when he was your age and lived here... <laughs> You know you were an awful greenhorn, Professor. <laughs> but always reading books he was, this Professor Pupin. Well, I must say he had plenty of time to read books. There wasn't much doing in the shops and factories that first winter he was here. Oh, how many weeks did you trust me for the rent, Mrs. Garrity? Enough weeks to make you my friend for life, Professor. Oh, gosh, I've been able to pay my rent pretty regularly. Well, those were pretty hard times right then. And anyway, the professor was always good for it. He always earned a dollar sooner or later. Oh, maybe he didn't eat, but he paid his rent with it. Oh, I knew what I was doing. I'd pay my rent and that you'd give me more food than the rent was worth. Oh, <laughs> oh I was wondering, Mrs. Garrity, how is your business? Well, I can't complain, but I could use a boy like you. Oh, I mean like you used to be, Professor. I need someone who will, oh, you know, tend the furnace, wash up the dishes, and make his own bed. Well, I can't apply for the job myself, but... Well, uh... maybe the professor will be able to find someone for you, Mrs. Garrity. Oh, I hope so. Uh, well, uh, we'll have to be going along. Mm, I know you. You just came to see whether I'm all right. <laughs> you know, son, this man is still trying to offer me back rent that's been paid long ago, and I won't take it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been very nice meeting you, Mrs. Garrity. It's been very nice meeting any friend of Professor Pupin. Hmm. <laughs> Goodbye, Mrs. Garrity. Goodbye, Professor Pupin. Goodbye, son. Goodbye, Mrs. Garrity. It won't work, Professor. Living at Mrs. Garrity's would help, but I've just got to earn money. Well, you probably could get your rent free that way. Well, sure, but that isn't any good. I'm going to leave the university and I'm going to get a regular job, have money in my pocket. I'm not going to live hand to mouth anymore. I'm in debt now. I'm, I'm scared when I think how much in debt I am. Two or three hundred dollars. And my expenses go on. Well, I can only say that we all have problems. Well, Jimmy Holmes never had problems like mine. 
and neither did you. Now listen to me. No, I won't listen. <laughs> Professor, you think it is easy for me to quit the university? You think it's going to be easy for me later on when I read about Jimmy Holmes or somebody else making experiments, making discoveries that I might have made? But it's impossible for me to go on. I've thought it all out, and it's impossible. Well, perhaps it is. I'll be sorry to lose you, Louis. Well, I... I will miss everything myself. I should think so. Professor. Yes? Here is the key to the lab. I hate to take this from you, my boy. Well, I have to give it back. Yes, I see. I will see you again, won't I, Louis? I'm coming to your lecture tomorrow. I, I would like to attend one last time. Ah, tomorrow. Very well. Tomorrow I'll say goodbye to you, Louis. You are listening to This Way to Tomorrow, starring Paul Lucas as Michael Pupin on The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. lecture hall in one of the buildings at Columbia University. The students have been assembled there for a few minutes, and Professor Michael Pupin stands behind his desk at the front of the room and begins his lecture. Now, gentlemen. No, no, no. You may put away your notebooks. Today, you will not need your notebooks. Today, instead of telling you any scientific facts, I want to talk to you a little about the scientist himself. The scientist is a darned fool in his personal life, I mean. He does not think of getting ahead in the world. <laughs> there is a colleague of mine who says that is why he does get ahead in the world. Well, at any rate, he's an impractical fellow, the scientist. And if you will forgive me, I will tell you about one particular scientist to illustrate what I mean. Now, this man came to America when he was 14 years old. He came in at Castle Garden. That was the gate to America in those days. And every so often, he goes back there. He remembers that morning. He remembers the crowds, the women in shawls, men in rough homemade suits. He can hear them. He can always hear them when he goes back. A dozen languages, the wailing of the homesick ones, the laughter of the brash, adventurous young ones, the babies crying immigrants coming to the new world. Hey, 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 here you are, folks. Genuine American pastry. Taste the sweets of the new world, hey, you are. There was a man selling pastry to the immigrants Taste that morning. Taste the sweets of the new world. You want to buy some sweets, green horn? Genuine American pastry. This boy picked out a prune pie. Five cents a piece. Five cents was all this boy had. That is all he had brought to America. Well, I'll take it. Thanks, kid. Thanks. Here's your pie. But when the boy bit into the pie, he screamed in the man's face that the prune pie was filled with stones. Well, they're prune stones, aren't they? You bought prune pie, you got pie filled with prune stones. You have no complaint, greenhorn. The boy walked away. Greenhorn. Tears were steaming down his face. He walked until, looking back, he could not see the duck anymore. He could not see the water anymore. He was walking alone on the streets. He hadn't one cent in the world. America, big, strange, and unfriendly, had closed around him. That was our friend's introduction to America. And here he was, with no money, walking, walking on streets that seemed to him as strange as the streets of Baghdad would seem to you students. Anyone could see that he was a greenhorn. And someone did see it and recruited him that day before he had a chance to starve to do work on a farm. Now, how many of you ever worked on a farm? Well, <clears throat> farm work was it's a scientist's first job in America. A farm is a restful place, 
though that work is hard. <laughs> the second day the boy was there, he was so stiff from everything he had done the first day that he was good for nothing but helping the farmer's daughter shell peas. I'm glad to have you help me. I don't like shelling peas anyway. He had never met a girl like her in the old country. A girl who spoke to him kindly, spoke to him as an equal, even though he was in a way her servant. I'm interested in your accent. He told her he was a Serbian. Tell me about your country. I don't know much about it. All he could think of to tell her at the moment was about Vilia, the wonderful heroine of the old Serbian ballad. The stories in Serbia change from night to night. The deeds performed in the stories are different each time, but always the heroine was the same. Vilia the gentle, Vilia the beautiful, Vilia with golden curls. Vilia was the inspiration and the spirit of all the Serbian ballads. Vilia sounds wonderful, the heroine incarnate, the woman all men have loved throughout the years. And so he dared to tell her that she was like Vilia. He was afraid of what she say, but she just smiled and thanked him. He told her that what he wanted most of all was to get over being a greenhorn. I can help you. And she did help him. He learned the geography and the history of this country from the daughter of his boss. Now, where else could that happen but in America? Professor? Yes? How did this boy ever become a scientist? Now, that's an interesting question. Perhaps it has something to do with the fact that this was America. That that's why the boy was able to become a scientist, because this was America. Well, anyhow, he went back to the city. And one day, he went to a factory and asked for work. Mm, no, no work. <laughs> I'm sorry, no work. So he left the factory. It was the noon hour. And the boys who did work in the factory were gathered in a group together. They had all just finished their lunch, and when this boy started to walk past them... Hey, look at the greenhorn! Green hey, wait a minute, where do you think you're going, greenhorn? He told them he wanted to pass. Well, ain't that sweet, he wants to pass. Yeah. The greenhorn wants to pass. Well, yeah. oh, see if you can get past this, greenhorn. Hey, oh, he staggered back from the force of the blow, but he was strong from his work on the farm, so he sprang back at his antagonist. Hey! hey. hey. He knocked the bully down. Nice work. Good going, Greenhorn. He did not understand. I said nice going. Congratulations. It was incredible. Wasn't this fellow a friend of the bullies? Sure, I'm a friend of his, but you beat him fair and square, didn't you? I said nice going. But weren't the rest of them going to hurt our boy? No, of course not. This is America, Greenhorn. We like a scrap here, but it's got to be fair. <laughs> It was that day, really, that our boy discovered America. It was a land when, where even the friends of a bully had gave you a chance. Oh, I don't say that he didn't ever have his doubts. After all, he was out of work. He was staying in a boarding house, but he soon ran out of money, and the landlady asked him for it. Well, you got this week's rent? He had to tell her that he didn't have it. Oh, you've got to have money. He said he was sorry. He said he would pack and get out of the boarding house in five minutes. Why, that's not what I mean. You've got to have money to live on. Here's five dollars. He couldn't believe it. Oh, go on, take it. But this woman was more incredible than the friends of the bully. Hurry up. I can't stand here with my hand out and five dollars in it all day long. But the boy wouldn't take it. Well, you are an unusual sort of a boy. You're unemployed. Now, how do you expect to get any money if you won't let people help you? He told her that he had a plan. And he did have a plan. At that time, the road outside the landlady's house was paved with cobblestones. Now, all you students have heard a horse wagon going over cobblestones, of course. Well, this boy got so that he could tell just by the sound a block away one kind of wagon from another. The only kind he was interested in was a coal wagon. When he heard a coal wagon, he followed it. He followed it through the streets until it stopped, and then the same thing always happened. Oh, oh, oh. Well, uh, uh, say, 
there. Uh, you the Carter Coal Company? I ain't the whole company myself, Mac, but you have the right idea. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this coal is for me. If you live in 357, it's for you. Oh, yes, yes, I do. I live right here. <laughs> now, I want you to carry the coal into the house for me. Oh, no. My job is to deliver 2,200 pound bags of coal onto the sidewalk outside of 357. Oh, and uh, that's just yeah, what I'm going to do. I know, but, but I'll pay you. No, if you're no, 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 thanks, mister. I got other deliveries yeah, to make. Yeah, I know, but I'm not strong enough. To, I'm an old man. I'm but... sorry, mister. Now, look out of the way. Yeah. I'm going to start heaving the bag. All right. But, oh, dear. Now, that was our boy's cue. He approached the man who had bought the coal. Yeah, me. <laughs> Where did you come from? He explained to the men, as he always explained to all of them, that he had followed the coal cart through the streets. You did what? Really? Now, now why? He told him that he did that every day. Followed coal wagons. He told him that he usually got the job of carrying the coal into the basement of the men who had bought it. Yeah, me, I, uh, I, I trust you will do this for me. And so the boy told him that, of course, he would. That this is how he made a living. Uh, uh. What an ingenious way of beating the unemployment situation. <laughs> You'll go far, young man. Many of them said things like that. But this man, the last man whose coal the boy ever carried into the basement, followed the boy as he went about his work. It's remarkable. Uh, tell me, what, what would you do if you had a regular job? And so the boy told him that he would save his money to get an education. <sighs> you have a regular job. <laughs> Here's my card, young man. You just report to my factory tomorrow morning. <laughs> Good luck to you. Well, class, that's all I'm going to tell you now. <clears throat> You'll have to take my word for it that the boy I've told you about became a scientist. He had not stayed on the farm. He had not stayed later on the factory. He went to school. This boy who grew up to be a scientist had to learn, uh, how is it you say it? He had to learn to roll with the punches, but to work hard, to do all in his power for his goal. He had to learn that people in this country were good and that they were good neighbors and wanted to help him. He worked hard and won a scholarship at Columbia University, and he became a scientist. And always, I almost forgot to mention this fact, always he had to send home $12 a week. Now, these things I tell you, you fill in the rest with your imagination. Class dismissed. Come in. Hello, Professor Pupi. Oh, Louis. I'm so happy you have come to my office. I've looked everywhere for you. I wanted to say goodbye to you. But that was nice of you, Professor, but... But what? I don't know that you will have to say goodbye to me. I want to stay, Professor. What? Yes, Professor. I, uh, I came to ask you for the key to the lab. I'm glad, Louis. Thank you for your lecture this morning, Professor. It didn't take me long to realize you were speaking about yourself. But I didn't know all those things about you. It doesn't matter that it was me, my boy. What really matters is that in this country, a young man has the opportunity to achieve. If, for example, my experiments with X-ray helped save a man's life the other day, or if your own experiments sometime bring benefits to others, then this American dream that every man has the opportunity to do the best he can is worth preserving. Professor. Yes? I, I would like to stay at Mrs. Garrity's from now on. Do you think you could fix it? Oh, but I've already fixed that, Louis. She has my old room waiting for you. Thank you, Paul Lucas.
Next week, Cavalcade presents the popular Hollywood screen star, Cornell Wilde. Our story is an original radio play called The Black Duster. This is a turbulent drama of the Dust Bowl, of bitter misunderstandings dividing a father and his son, and how a girl's love united them both. Be sure to join us this same time next week for Cornell Wilde in The Black Duster. Tonight's original DuPont Cavalcade, This Way to Tomorrow, was rip- written by Robert Senadella. Cavalcade is pleased to announce that Paul Lucas will soon be seen in the RKO production, Berlin Express. Uh, featured in tonight's play with Paul Lucas was Billy Redfield as the boy. The music was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Bryan. And this is Ted Pearson inviting you to listen next week to The Black Duster, starring Cornell Wilde. Cavalcade of America is presented each week from the stage of the Longacre Theater on Broadway in New York and is brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.